and I had a phase in my life where I used to smuggle hashish out of India. And I used to go to the Crawford Market in Bombay with kilos of gold strapped on my body. And the, the Crawford Market is just a, a labyrinth of millions of teeming people. And I would, they would tell me, go to the second crossroad in Duncan's Lane and then dismiss your cab. And I would do that, and then there would be a, 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 a child there who would take me by the hand and lead me through this labyrinth of streets to this uh, Muslim gangster called the Baby Elephant. Uh, this huge guy drenched in perfume with all of his lieutenants around him. And they were always very happy to see me because we were going to do business. They had more hash than they knew what to do with. I had gold, which they wanted. They were very helpful. And yet, you know, this was a criminal enterprise fraught with danger. And I never fully trusted them. And also, we had to smoke enormous amounts of hashish to complete these deals. So you're always trying to get as loaded as you possibly could, but also perfectly aware that at their pleasure, they could kill you in a moment and the consequences would be nil because they had the whole city of Bombay paid off. So it was this ambiguous thing. And, and, the, and, the, and the elves and the general um, mythology of elves is like this. You know, elves respect intelligence. The way they relate to intelligence is they set you riddles Elves are about language. If you're stupid, they make you sleep for a hundred years at the center of their hills and don't let you go back. If you can riddle their riddle and riddle in return, then they think you're a fine fellow and they let you crawl back to the pub or whatever it is. So there is this... Uh, there, the word that I use to describe the, my feeling about the DMT space is it's zany. It's like, it's like a coyote cartoon or a Marx Brothers film. It's a land of explosions and falling anvils. And yet, it's all for fun. But you have the feeling that these guys play so rough that their idea of fun might also include the possibility of handing you four sticks of dynamite on a short fuse just because it would be so amusing to do that. So... It's, uh, it's got a funny emotional vibe to it. It's lots of fun, but you really want to be on your toes and to try and get as much out of it as you can. One idea that I've played with about what's going on is there is, again, extrapolating from these hashish deals in India, it seemed to me they were like meme traders. Memes, you know, are the smallest units of an idea or an ideology. Well, it's like they, they're in there and they show you all this stuff. And it's the equivalent of trade goods. You know, beads and baubles to trade with the natives in Newtonian space. And they're saying, wouldn't you like this? Wouldn't you like this? And you're like some poor Amazonian Indian being shown fountain pens that when you turn them upside down, ladies undress and stuff like that. You think, my lord, I've never seen anything like that. I must possess it. But what we have that they want, I I'm not sure uh, what it is we can offer them. Yeah. Um, do you feel like if you were less on your toes than you should be, you would be in any danger. I mean, you also said at one point that you felt tremendous affection from them as well. It's like presumably they're going to take care of you to some extent, right? It's almost like the problem of a child playing with a spider or something. They have affection for you, but they don't really understand how you work. They don't really understand your limits, you know? and they might just simply shoot past your limits by accident and leave you a quaking wreck in some asylum for the rest of your life and they'll feel very badly about it but uh, you know it's just a case of uh, a misstep no it's never happened I, we've never lost anybody i have had the experience of turning people on to it and having them 
you know, go through the rapid eye movement and all that, and then come down, and you say, what happened? And they say, absolutely nothing happened. And furthermore, I'd rather not have anything to do with you anymore. <laughs> this is it. I've had it, and thanks, and please don't come around anymore. You can take your elf machines and your whole wrath and just fade from my life as quickly as possible, and I'd be perfectly happy. Then I accommodate in that case. Because uh, I really think that, uh, like I've noticed, people who have that experience are people who probably were a bad risk to start with. I get the feeling that if you can't stand it, you can't remember it. It's almost, there is a safety thing there. But my hope is that through ayahuasca analogs and the spreading knowledge of these new botanical sources and by inspiring biochemists and generally by just getting this out of the closet that we'll begin to form a consensus. I mean, I've been all over the world, dug into all kinds of strange stuff, and this is the weirdest thing, this side of the yawning grave, without contest. And yet, it appears perfectly harmless, easily accessed, if you know the, the route. And I just don't see how human civilization can continue to operate in ignorance of these uh, places. It's very peculiar that it is so little discussed and talked about. I would place it... Well, I, I think I said the other night about human sexuality. You can hardly get through adulthood and to the grave without it confronting you in some fashion or another because we're enzymatically and hormonally wired to have some confrontation with our nature as sexual beings. But this, which is equally profound and in some ways more, well, I don't know, I mean, more dramatic, uh, millions and millions of people have gone to the grave without ever having it enter their mind that such a thing is possible. So it's like a, uh, a button on the dashboard of your physiology. And I think we should, it, it's part of the mystery of who we are. It's central to the mystery of cognition, mind, uh, self-identity, sexuality, uh, the whole nine yards. And yet, probably 95% of the human race never encounters it, unless everybody encounters it in the act of dying. But then what does that mean if you can have a deep anticipation of it and live your life in the light of it simply by availing yourself of the chemical means of, uh, of triggering it? I mean, I, I think it inclines people toward deep philosophical reflection on the nature of life, time, being, self-identity, language, so forth and so on. It is the one thing that you eventually, around sometime between age 7 and 12, we all become convinced that a certain X factor doesn't exist, that we have to lay it aside with the dreams of childhood, that where we bury the Easter rabbit and Santa Claus, we bury this expectation. Well, then when you smoke DMT, you just say, my God, you know, the world is made of magic. The primary reality is a, a hidden, magical, unimaginable dimension. So it appears. And yet, our entire civilization has been reared in ignorance of this. And we split the atom, sequence DNA, hurl machines outside the solar system, and apparently don't know jack shit about who we are. Bizarre. <laughs>